the leg G. It's guessing there. I saw you at the select committee. It's been a long time. Double fracture. Welcome back to lots of familiar faces in the room. Thank you for joining us this morning for our breakfast event on integrated care. Uh, we are live streaming the event. There are members of the press uh, present in the room today, just to make you aware of that. This is very much on the record. We will be joined shortly by uh, our other contributor. I'll introduce the two colleagues already here, uh, Claire Fuller, who's been delayed by train problems uh, this morning, and we have a fantastic uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, Graham Winyard on my right, Paul Moback at the far end, and as I say, Claire also bringing different perspectives on the debate. Graham is one of the claimants in one of the judicial reviews going ahead uh, with the concerns expressed about the proposed ACO contract. Uh, Paul is the chief officer of the CCG in Dudley, which plans to use the contract if and when it becomes available to develop integrated care led by GPs in the West Midlands. And Claire is a GP, leader of one of the 10 integrated care systems that have been identified across uh, England and seeking to work at scale to try and make stronger connections within the NHS and between the NHS, local government and the third sector. So we've got a great uh, set of speakers this morning. I'm going to start in a moment by offering some thoughts from our work here at the Fund. But a few housekeeping announcements. On this, this slide you can see you can access our wireless network and the details are there. If you are on Twitter and you'd like to share what you're hearing and uh, learning from today, then please do so using that hashtag. Please do uh, turn your phones on to silent to not disturb speakers or indeed uh, fellow participants in our discussion this morning. And finally, there is no planned fire alarm. Um, on a recent previous occasion, it did go off, so this is for real, uh, but hopefully not today. Follow the green sign, exit through the entrance where you came in the building this morning, and the mustering point is around the corner in Chandos Street. So fingers crossed that burning toast I smelt when I came down the stairs five minutes ago will not provoke a fire alarm into a real alarm as opposed to a practice alarm. But if it goes off, it really is for real. So that's the uh, background for today. We will finish promptly at uh, 9.45 this morning. And we will have plenty of time for questions and for discussion. Each speaker will talk for around about seven or eight minutes, setting out their views on the issues of the day. And I hope that will leave us around about 30 minutes at the end of the morning so we can engage with you and explore these really topical and important issues. I was yesterday as one of the advisors to the select committee on its inquiry into integrated and accountable care, uh, sitting in on the uh, session where the committee took evidence from NHS England, NHS Improvement and the Department of Health. And a number of the issues I'm sure that will arise today were also aired on that occasion, so maybe an opportunity to bring them into our discussion as well. So let me start by saying from the Fund's point of view, uh, I think many of you will be aware we've been 
making the case for integrated care to be one of the top priorities for the NHS and for local government and the social care system for very many years, going back to the Future Forum, if you can remember that, and related uh, initiatives by successive governments. It seems to us that it's a no-brainer. If you look at the demographic change, the shift in the disease burden, the concerns about multi-morbidity, we need a health and care system that really is joined up around patients and around populations. That's what the five-year forward view is attempting to do. And that's increasingly what's happening locally in a lot of the work that some of you <coughs> will be involved in. So we've welcomed and supported the uh, move in that direction. But of course, uh, real concerns have been raised in some quarters, reflected in the two judicial reviews that are underway at the moment, specifically about the development of accountable care organisations, the proposed national contract not yet in use, uh, that might be a vehicle for promoting integrated care. So we thought we would organise the breakfast today to air these different issues, to hear hopefully many different sides of the argument for and against and maybe as yet undecided. <laughs> and therefore we hope you'll go away at the end of this morning better informed. We may or may not have changed minds, but that's for you to decide, not for us. So what I wanted to do briefly to set the scene, then I'll ask Graham to come and make the first uh, contribution, is just to define some of the different terms that are around. And you'll find on our website uh, a long read that I wrote about a month ago, and then more recently an update on what's happening in the 10 integrated care systems. Actually, it went on our website yesterday, if you want to look at these issues in a little more, more detail. So I'm going to define three different versions of integrated care. First of all, the 10 integrated care systems that have evolved from the STPs uh, within the NHS in England, taking a lead in planning and commissioning care for their populations. Not actually delivering integrated care, I'll come on to that, but I'll say planning and commissioning across uh, footprints of varying sizes and varying complexities. Surrey Heartlands, where Claire Fuller is leading, is one of those ten. And as I've said here, what they essentially do is bring together public sector organisations, the NHS, local authorities, to plan, to commission, and to build on what the STPs said when they were written and submitted back in October 2016. Expectation being, there'll be more than 10. There'll be further areas announced for inclusion in this program at some point in the not too distant future with the aspiration that perhaps all areas of England in due course will be covered by these integrated care systems. Not statutory bodies, uh, voluntary collaborations between the organisations working within the geographies covered by these systems. Here you can see on the map the geographical uh, spread, of course, the language has changed recently. Uh, they were called accountable care systems, the language has shifted now to integrated care. And that illustrates the variations in size and complexity. Just to illustrate that, up in the far northwest, Blackpool and Far Coast is the smallest, 300,000 people. Uh, Greater Manchester is the largest, with 2.7 million, and quite a wide spread in between. <coughs> South Yorkshire is one of the ten, and the point of this slide is to illustrate that within these systems there are communities like Barnsley and Doncaster which are important in relation to integrated care because this is where providers are coming together, commissioners are coming together around much more defined, recognisable local communities. So these integrated care partnerships within the integrated care systems are where most of the work is going on to bring these services together and to think about population <laughs> and place. And so we've distinguished between these integrated care partnerships defined here uh, from the systems, planning in the systems, service delivery in the partnerships, usually in the partnerships, social care, public health and other services also involved. And many areas that are not integrated care systems are also developing 
integrated care partnerships. And I know looking around the room, there are colleagues involved in doing precisely that because there's a groundswell behind this is uh, a good thing to do and the right thing to do. And then thirdly, the definition of accountable care organisations. The term originating in the United States, and I'll come back to that, but we're defining an ACO in the NHS in England in the way I've uh, set out here. An organisation that is asked to take on responsibility uh, for a budget and a range of services <coughs> following a competitive procurement led by CCGs for the population they are serving. And an ACO might be a single organisation, but very often we would expect it would be an organisation that would subcontract with a range of other providers so collaboratively they could deliver on the contract that they take on. Expectation being that these might be longer term contracts, 5, 10, 15 years, based on outcomes moving away from the current contracting round, which is very much focused on the detail, to something that could look much different around a population and the outcomes that are important for that population. And Paul will talk about the ambitions in Dudley as one of the two areas of England that have said we would like to use this contract when and if it becomes available and what the intentions are there. So there is a lot of complexity and I hope those uh, simple definitions are clear and helpful. Back to the United States, this is where the language of ACOs originated. Back in uh, 2014, time flies, we did some work with colleagues in the States. What's the evidence that ACOs might bring some benefits from the States? Recognising the context here is very, very different, and that's an important point to bear in mind. Well, the language of accountable care organisations is very recent, and the experience of the ones that are being set up is very mixed. Uh, there is not a compelling case based on the evidence we have from the recent ACOs that this will deliver uh, a great uh, many benefits or indeed save uh, resources. The longer term history though before the ACO term was invented of the integrated systems in the states like Kaiser Permanente much more positive, uh, a much longer track record of delivering good outcomes within the resources they have available. But let's recognise that the evidence is, as I say, very mixed and still developing because the history here is quite recent. And more recently still, this paper from the BMJ, Hugh Aldwick, one of our colleagues here at the Fund, is a Harkness Fellow this year, based in uh, California, is looking um, at these issues in more detail and with other colleagues in the States published this paper about two or three weeks ago, which gives you a more current update on the state of play. So let me bring my brief comments together uh, and uh, highlight this as the final slide. Uh, we believe better involvement from others in the public sector. The focus of concern, I'm sure Graham will speak about this, has been much more... There are now only two areas of which Dudley is one, City of Manchester is the other, that have expressed a wish to use the contract. And in both of those areas, the initial stages around the procurement has identified NHS trusts as the preferred providers. We know, don't we, that private providers have had an increasing role in the NHS. They've been successful in bidding for and winning contracts, especially uh, contracts for community services, but they frankly do not have the range of capabilities that would be needed to take on an ACO contract. An ACO contract would require a successful bidder to be able to deliver a range of primarily community services, including primary care, perhaps including social care, and some hospital-based services. And there are few, if any, private providers in a position to do that. And you may have seen that David Hare of the NHS Partners Network confirmed in the Health Service Journal this week that it's very unlikely that private providers will choose to compete when that ACO contract becomes available. So for that reason, we continue to support the 
emerging interest in integrated care and linked to that the growing interest in going beyond integrated care to promote population health across place and across population. It's an example of the kind of partnership working and collaboration within the public sector that holds the promise of bringing benefits. We need uh, more evidence to be clear which versions will bring the greatest benefits, but uh, we hope to continue playing a part of the fund in some of the important work that is going on. Enough from me. Welcome to Claire. Sorry. Thank you for navigating the delights of the South Western Railway <coughs> train system this morning and for joining us, Claire. Um, I introduced you in your absence, so I shan't repeat what I said, but we're delighted to see you in the room today. And Graham, may I invite you to uh, carry on from where I've left off? Thank you. How does a happily retired 71-year-old former apparatchik, someone who I think would be known for conciliation rather than confrontation, come to be a claimant in a judicial review against the Secretary of State and the NHS? This was never on any bucket list of mine. <laughs> but it often rhymes, and I felt I was detecting a worrying rhyme. Going back to the 1990s, when I was more at the heart of things, the NHS was chronically short of capital. The obvious solution was for the Treasury, which can borrow money far more cheaply than anyone else, to provide more capital. But we were told the received managerial political wisdom was that was not possible. But instead, we were offered a cunning workaround in which the NHS and the private sector would get together to build and run hospitals. Critics, and there were many, my fellow claimant Alison, Pollock, Chris, were brushed aside. We knew what needed to be done. They needed to get with the programme. We didn't want any of these abstract difficulties. The recent uh, National Audit Office report has confirmed what a financially catastrophic policy this has been. The NHS has paid way over the odds for its hospitals. It's been fleeced on related services like insurance and management consultancy. And it is saddled with long-term service contracts that it can't afford, but can't afford to get out of. Fast forward 25 years, as well as a desperate funding crisis in the NHS, there is, I think, general agreement that it's really struggling with a fragmented structure and an over-commercialised procurement process. And this all gets in the way of providing joined-up patient care. The pretty obvious solution, you might think, would be to unscramble some of that legislation. But we're told that's not possible. Instead, we're offered an ingenious workaround, which will bring organisations together into new non-statutory bodies, which can include private sector organisations as partners. And we're going to do that using 10 to 15 year long-term contracts. Does that resonate? Does that sound familiar? What could possibly go wrong? Well, I think quite a lot. And it hasn't helped that this policy has not been developed openly. Whatever you think of the ACO policy, it represents really substantial change that in any other time would have been open with public services if you behave in an evasive way <coughs> when introducing new policy, you can only expect that distrust to get worse. And this judicial review has been crowdfunding. We've raised £280,000 without difficulty from 9,000 odd donors. These are lots and lots and lots of small people who don't just click agree on something. They put their hands in their pockets and give us money. 
That, I think, is a measure of good measure of value that is required. Now, the other problem with not setting out the policy properly in the first place, and it was interesting, the House of Commons Library, when it produced its briefing paper, it had to turn to the King's Fund for a definition. I mean, what sort of governance is this when the Department of Health can't provide one simple, clear explanation of what it's up to? Uh, the other problem is if you don't set out your policy clearly, it may well be you're not quite sure what you're doing. And certainly the people you want to do it aren't sure either. Now, it may surprise you to learn, having said all that, that I'm actually an enthusiast for the idea of a single organisation taking most decisions about health and care for a geographically defined population. It's a very good idea. It's an idea I remember because I used to work for one. It was called a district health authority. It was very simple. It worked very well. It's not, I'm not suggesting a return to the rose-tinted 1980s as the solution to all our problems, but it had a lot of virtues. It was simple. It was clear. We were accountable. And one of the reasons it worked so well was we were both the commissioner and the provider. What I do find difficult, and maybe my fellow speakers um, can enlighten me, is how it works if you've got a single provider organization and are over them active commissioning. I would have thought they'd be all over each other. Um, and I tend to agree with NHS England's highly paid solicitors when they write crucially to be really effective, ACOs would also need to be able to commission as well as provide services. Now, unfortunately, that's legally dubious, and that's part of the judicial review, and I won't bore you with it. But it does seem odd that we've got a degree of ambiguity about the relationship of commissioning to ACOs that's unresolved. One way of doing it, resolving it, of course, is to say we, and Chris alluded to this, ACOs will be commissioned on the basis of long-term health outcomes. That's attractive, particularly to somebody like me with a public health background, but it does have important implications. Those measures are long-term, they change slowly, and adopting that approach would mean that decisions about most of the issues related to health care that people worry about will be passed to the ACO. You can't, I think, have an active commissioner and an active ACO. It's like those Swiss chalets that tell the weather. One, one person can be out and the other has got to be in. Um, why does that matter? It's because the CCG at the moment, whatever you think of them, is the key vehicle for public accountability. The lighter its touch, the more the discretion would lie with the ACOs, and the legal form and governance of ACOs are for them to determine. So we would be moving to an NHS where most of the decisions that matter to the public will be taken by non-statutory bodies that can include private and commercial partners whose priority will be profit, not public service. Difficult decisions are always going to be inescapable. What will be provided, what won't be provided. Thresholds for treatment. These organisations will be managing the boundary between health which is means tested. But because the, require, the current procurement requirements work as they are, ACOs <laughs> will have to be established by these long-term commercial contracts and they can take legal forms that included private for profit companies. And so we could easily end up in a situation where it's in the clear financial interests of an ACO to progressively reduce some form of care 
that it provides free from public funds in favour of means-tested packages of care rebadged. The commercial partners within the ACO would no doubt step forward to fill the gaps with services that people would pay for and offers of insurance policies and top-up arrangements. And we, if you think this is fantasy, this is what is already happening in the dental sector. Now, the reason the rhyme of history is important, I think the history of the PFI should leave us in no doubt that if there are opportunities to profit from the NHS, they will be ingeniously and enthusiastically exploited by people whose priority is profit rather than public service. This is entirely possible within the legal frameworks being set out in the draft ACO contracts. This won't happen suddenly. <coughs> There's not, as Chris was saying, I think this is a bit of a false uh, straw target, um, something that's used for money laundering, among other uses, with people round the table, the real decision-taking table, as well as the NHS partners. It's no argument to say that the first two are all run by nice, cuddly NHS folk with the right attitudes. I'm sure they are, but this <coughs> is a policy that will roll forward in all sorts of different ways, and we won't see where it goes until we wake up to the problems and we discover there are these 10, 15-year contracts in place like the Private Finance Initiative. That's why I've roused myself from my happy retirement. I'm glad I have done and am entirely unapologetic and I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, just to clarify one point, if the ACO contracts were removed, would you be supportive of the other developments that I and others have referred to? Oh, I, I think there is, as I was saying, a simple solution. If, par if Parliament could make ACOs democratically accountable public bodies, all my... Uh, reservations disappear really and I understand there was an offer at the Health Select Committee from the Labour MPs yesterday to support a one clause bill that could do that well that's well, uh, as I said at the beginning leading the development of the MCP Vanguard in Dudley and uh, keen to have access to the ACO contract to be able to take that forward. Paul, we look forward to your presentation. Okay. Thank you, um, Chris. I, I, mean, I think there is one thing actually that uh, we can agree on, which is that, uh, and I agree on with uh, Graham, which is that we want better integrated care. In fact, I, uh, I struggle to find anyone that argues that we want disintegrated care. Um, and as a, there's a key reason for that, and that is that the demand and the needs in our population is changing. So if you take uh, Dudley, a third of our population now are living with at least one long-term condition. And they want really effective continuity of care, the different professions that link to uh, delivering and supporting their long-term condition to work better together. And we also have more and more people living with multiple complex comorbidities. And they just don't, they don't just want good inter uh, co uh, continuity of care, they want really effective coordination of care as well. Um, but furthermore, in addition to that, if we're really going to deliver sustainable services, we need our population to be able to take better self-agency for themselves, with themselves and their carers and their social networks, um, and we need to be able to support that better. We need to be able to take a longer-term population health management point of view. And for all of those reasons, and in Dudley, we've already had a partnership in place for quite a long time, which has involved the CCG, the council, our NHS providers, together to deliver some of the improvements that um, we're trying to achieve on, on continuity of care and effective coordination. So we've had multidisciplinary teams in place for many years, teams of staff from across the different agencies working together around general practice 
to deliver better coordinating care for our population. And the results that they're delivering are staggering. Uh, the patients that they're seeing, um, two-thirds of them now report that they feel m much less socially, uh, socially isolated than they were before because they're getting a holistic, complete service. Um, they feel much more confident in the management of their conditions so that their use of primary care is reduced by as much as 24%. So we're already delivering better outcomes and better care for our population. So that you might think that's an argument for saying, well, well, let's leave things as they are. Let's leave them as an alliance partnership. Why do we need to go the step further? And my argument, quite simply, is, well, is if integrated care is the right thing to do, why wouldn't you want to do it to its maximum potential benefit, to deliver the maximum benefit you can for, for both our population, but also our staff that are trying to work with our population? Um, why wouldn't you want to try and maximise their potential to work effectively together in the best interest of the population we serve? And there are, there are really kind of four fundamental reasons, I think, why, for us, Trying to achieve that maximum uh, potential integration through a single integrated care organisation, which for us is the MCP, supported by a, a single population-based, outcome-based contract is really important. And there, there are four reasons, first of all. First of all, it's about outcomes, and it's about outcomes for the population and for the patient. And those outcome improvements are multifactorial. Uh, we've done a lot of work in Dudley trying to, to look at what are the outcome benefits we want to achieve. Um, and how do we bring staff together to most effectively achieve those outcomes? But you're only really going to be able to maximise the potential on that um, if you can genuinely integrate systems, integrate ways of working, because it is a really complex challenge and complex task. But the outcomes work and the objectives that we've set in Dudley, uh, we think that we, um, the impact of that, if we do it successfully, over the first five years of the MCP, MCP being in place, is that we're aiming to improve healthy life expectancy by a year and a half for the population as a whole. So in five years, the average life, healthy life expectancy will increase over and above current trends by a year and a half. And we can already evidence that by some of the work we've been done, done so far. Um, so for example, in, in hypertension, um, standardised mortality in hypertension in Dudley, with a concerted effort year after year, teams working together across primary care and, other, um, and uh, with our practice-based pharmacists and others, We've reduced standardised mortality in Dudley from more than double the national average to 20% below the national average. We've done that because we've integrated the way we're working. And we think we can deliver more and deliver better outcomes for our population if we integrate to the maximum potential. Uh, the second key reason for uh, trying to establish an MCP or an integrated care organisation is all about primary care, our GPs. Uh, if you talk to the public, which we've done a lot of in Dudley, we've done a lot of engagement and consultation on this, for them the heart of the NHS starts with the general practice and their registration with the GP. In Dudley, um, if you take account of closures of branch surgeries, we're losing a, a practice once every six months at the moment, and that's because primary care in its current form is not sustainable. But general practice and our GPs are central to the way we deliver care, and they're essential to the way the public expect care to be delivered. Uh, be delivered. They're, they're the heart of the NHS. So we need to find ways of making primary care more sustainable. And for us that means GPs leading multidisciplinary integrated teams, being supported by a much wider network of services around general practice, not having general practice standing alone. And uh, the ACO contract and the MCP offers the opportunity to integrate general practice with the rest of the NHS in a way that's not been done before. It's not, it doesn't enforce it, but what it does mean is that you can't create an ACA, you can't create an integrated core care organisation without general practice, because general practice is a care organisation. <laughs> but the point about it is that it's flexible, but it also places general practice at the heart of it, and you can't deliver it without general practice. The benefits to our wider staff, so the, the, the strongest advocates for our integrated working in Dudley are actually the staff who are in our multidisciplinary teams. And if, if they were up here on stage, they make a much more eloquent job of describing the benefits that they have, that they experience with their patients and that they experience together. Uh, because by being able to work together as teams, their, their identity and purpose as a team together with their pa the patients that they're working with is much stronger and much more purposeful and much more meaningful than necessarily the individual organisations that they're all part of. But one of the challenges that we have at the moment is that once we have fully integrated teams at the interface with the patient and with the population, 
they're all part of separate organisations, and they're bought and they're all reporting in through managers to chief execs to boards that are all separate, that all have separate accountabilities, that all work to separate objectives set by the regulators, that actually work to separate objectives set by us as a CCG. Far better if we have one single management, one single board that's aligned to the purposes of our frontline staff, that's aligned to the purposes of our patients to deliver that integrated care. We think we can achieve far more progress far more quickly if we have a single organisation that's working, that's not a top-down approach, but a, a, an organisation that is behind our staff, enabling them to maximise their potential with our population. And also by having genuinely integrated teams, we think it offers far more opportunity for workforce development across the different um, professions because they're all working as one for one organisation. Um, the last reason for creating an accountable care organisation um, is from a commissioning perspective. Um, so I'm a commissioner of services and at the moment the way we commission healthcare actually works against integration. Uh, it's a complete nonsense that we commission healthcare in a way that works against the way our patients and our population and our staff want to work. And I'll give you one simple example, but there are many. If you take diabetic care, in Dudley there are about 20,000 diabetics, um, all of whom are seen by their GP, all of whom, and the GP is working to an outcomes framework which is about supporting the stable management of those patients. A significant number of those patients also see the diabetologist based in the hospital. But we don't pay them on the basis of supporting integrated working. We don't pay them on the basis of supporting uh, better long-term conditions management of, that, management of their patient's condition. We pay them regardless of the outcome they achieve on the basis of the more times they see someone, the more money they get. That's a nonsense. Why aren't we aligning the way we commission care to really to support our, di our diabetologists and our GPs to work together to the same outcome objectives? Why aren't we paying um, for our social workers, our mental health workers and our community staff to work together collaboratively in MDCs with our GPs. So it seems to me that, it's that we have a duty as commissioners of healthcare to align the way we commission to the way our public and our patients and our staff want to work. To actually go against that is, a, is quite frankly, a, irresponsible. And um, it's, we have a duty to do what we can to commission services in a way that maximises potential for our staff to work effectively with our population. So from in, to kind of summarise, uh, for me the key question is, if you agree that integrated care is the way we should be delivering <coughs> services, the question really is how far do you want to go with it? We can leave things where we work in partnerships and alliances and we can make a lot of progress on that and we are doing making a lot of progress in Dudley on that basis. But personally I think we can go a lot further and deliver much better results and achieve much more if we genuinely fully integrate the way we deliver services. Um, that maximise the potential for our staff to achieve what they can for their population. Thank you. And Paul, as I welcome uh, Claire to complete the presentations, uh, you have identified two local NHS trusts as the preferred provider of your ATO. That's, that, yeah, that's right. Um, and they're coming together actually to create a new NHS, or they're to create a new NHS trust, which will be the integrated care organisation. Claire, uh, welcome Claire, as I said earlier on, a practicing GP, being a leader of the CCG in Surrey Heartlands and is now leading with other colleagues the integrated care system. I was with you last week at a big event you had to celebrate progress so far and to look forward to the future. So Claire, thanks for joining us. Thank you Chris. Uh, apologies everybody for being late. I think I've been on every single possible train line that um, <laughs> South Western Rail have. Uh, tra tra signal failures that haven't an abandoned train at Aldershot and I've come by, I've I've lost track anyway, so apologies. Um, so, uh, I'm here to talk about Surrey Heartland. So, we are not an ACO and we have no aspiration to become an ACO. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we have managed to deliver integration and change within the uh, confines of the current legislation. So, within Surrey Heartlands, we're a uh, Wave 1 ACS. We've got a population of 850,000, budget of 1.3 billion. Uh, spread across 10 organisations. And for any of you that know <laughs> Surrey of old, uh, you will have 
seen any different configurations of possible barriers <coughs> to try and make Surrey work. Surrey doesn't work. We have open <coughs> borders, we have patients that flow into South West London, into North West London, into Sussex, into Hampshire and into Frimley. Wherever you draw the line around us, there will always be patients whose natural flows leave and go beyond it. But one of our acute trusts, actually, the one site sits within Surrey Heartlands, one site sits. When you come to have conversations about how you do planning, I have got regulators that have never really had conversations before that I'm then trying to engage. Stuff is not easy. Um, Distinctive features about Surrey Heartland, we signed a <coughs> devolution uh, agreement with NHC, NHSI, Surrey County Council and the three CCGs back in June. And behind our devolution uh, agreement has very much been a vision about joining up the fragmented health spend. So very much bringing together uh, the NHS England direct commissioning spend, looking at how we can work differently with dental, with the ophthalmologists with specialised commissioning, but also we've signed MOUs with Health Education England and with the HSN and we're looking to explore how we can work differently uh, with uh, Public Health England so that we can join up what is a fragment, fragmented budget so that we can work together with the broader public sector and make sure that we bring influence across the whole field uh, rather, to improve our population's health outcomes rather than just focusing on that 20% that health can do on its own. So no matter how good we make healthcare and how accessible we make healthcare, we will only ever improve um, people, the population's health outcome by 20%. So Surrey, most people will think of Surrey as being full of very crowded trains that are travelling between half past six and half past eight into London. But actually, uh, we have a very high number of elderly uh, people and a very high carer population, as well as a big learning disability population and a big... Gypsy Roman, Gypsy Roman traveller population. And as such, we've, one of our principles and one of our underlying commitments is to make generational change rather than continued crisis management. And we're doing this through a commitment to the first thousand days, which will include uh, improving the, the readiness of our children as they enter school, so making sure our children enter school uh, with a narrow as possible gap in health inequalities, because we know that if you hit school with health inequality, that gap will only get bigger and also by focusing on the mental health of our young people in Surrey because the mental health of a young person as a girl aged 14 is the best predictor of the health inequality of a child aged 4 which is still my favourite fact of the year because it's just astounding. So, how are we doing this? Um, our plan is that our ICPs, which are integrated care partnerships, not organisations, uh, will take on responsibility for capitated budgets for identified population segments by 2019. We're going to do this by having an integrated strategic commissioner at the Surrey Heartlands level and then have the place of based delivery models around each one of our acute trust flows. So over the last year, I find myself increasingly talking about governance and strategy, which I have to say, when I started becoming involved in um, um, in a managerial role uh, in the very early days of the CCG, so having come from being a jobbing salary GP into the early days of CCGs, I can remember us all going, strategy, governance, what are they? And now I find my whole life really, um, I now realise what they are and how important they are, so you'll all be very willing to hear that. So. Um, I was really interested in the point about democratic accountability because actually that's been one of our real drivers in how we have organised our system. So we have four structures, all of which are voluntary uh, and are, uh, are not legislated, but take advantage of what is the Health and Social Care Act. So we have a transformation board, which is made up of uh, all of our ten organisational CEOs, plus medical directors or clinical leads, uh, chaired by David McNulty, who is an independent chair, but was previously the um, Chief Executive at Surrey County Council. And it's been David's leadership right from the early days of, even back when we were an SDP rather than an ICF, that I think has led to our devolution agreement and also mm -hmm. very much to our different ways of working. <coughs> so we have a transformation board. We have a joint commissioning committee, which is made up of our CCG governing body members, so including lay members and clinical leads, but still 
sticking to the principle of a clinical majority for decision making, but sitting alongside them are elected cabinet members from Surrey County Council. We also, on the Joint Commission Committee, have NHSE and NHSI representation, and Matthew Tate, who is our Joint Accountable Officer, actually holds a joint contract with NHSE. So he has some, what, they call, what they're calling synthetic devolution, whereby uh, virtue of his contract with <coughs> NHS England, he is enabled to enact some of NHS England's powers at place for us. So we then move on and we have our place-based ICPs, uh, which really is everybody at place sitting around the table. So commissioners with providers, with social care, with voluntary, with mental health and with primary care at scale. Uh, and then our fourth voluntary uh, place is our academy, which is a virtual uh, clinical advisory group, really, which who have the remit to uh, set the outcomes to make sure our care is standardised across the integrated care system to bring innovation and to spread best practice. So when we talk about the, an ICS, we talk about a combination of a strategic commissioner plus the broader Transformation Board partnership, so it is the two together. And the Royal Transformation Board is driving the strategic change, shaping culture and creating an environment for, in which change happens. And you can only do that if you've got commitment from senior leadership. So we meet monthly as a Transformation Board. We've just had a two-day, again, developmental uh, residential, uh, and the Chief Executive <laughs> meet a uh, fortnightly in between to make sure we drive change forward. Joint Committee is our governance vehicle for the Integrated Strategic Commissioner, and they agree the outcomes that have been advised by the Academy. They set the budget for the ICPs, and they have a performance management and an assurance role, and will also hold uh, digital commissioning at scale, so the things that you only want to do once across a big footprint, so um, your, your estates, your digital, your comms, all the things that, that make sense. When you start looking at what happens at our ICP level, that's about delivery. And one of our one of our earliest and most advanced ICPs is really in the Epsom area, so Epsom Health and Care, which has uh, been around for a couple of years and has been a joint contract. So the the money flows from CCG to lead providers, so down through the acute trust, which is Epsom St Helia in that instance, and then Epsom St Helia have a have an alliance contract across all partners. So. Uh, the GP Federation, uh, Adult Social Care, Mental Health, uh, and the Community Provider. And each one of those partners has an equal vote in all decision making. And there is a right of veto. So if, unless all partners agree, nothing happens. So the GPs feel safe in that environment because actually you can go, don't like it, and the change doesn't happen. Staff that work in Epsom Health and Care remained employed, remain employed by the host organisation. But they all wear, we had the lanyard moment where everybody actually uh, chose a colour and chose a name and actually started wearing a single lanyard. So when, so when I, so if I've got a patient that is under the care of Epsom Health and Care, somebody will come out wearing orange lanyard and I won't know and Mrs Holden, who uh, was seen yesterday, won't know whether they come from the acute trust, primary care or community. Um, by working together, they've driven down length of stay, so in the acute trust, they've knocked a day off the length of stay, they've reduced uh, non-elective admissions by 5%, and they've reduced A&E attendances in that age group, which is the over 65s as well. So you can see, it, it, of course it's integrated working that, that is making the change happen, but you don't necessarily need uh, a formal you don't necessarily need a single organisation to deliver it. There are other ways of doing it. So we are, I'm nearly done. We have an integrated care system which is built on voluntary partnership with aligned priorities. So systems, and particularly our system in Surrey, is a very much a dynamic moving beast. To create <coughs> that into a single organisation, I think would be nigh on impossible because as we've found in the past, if you try and draw a line around it, it doesn't work. It may work in other bits of the country, but for us, it just doesn't work because of the patient flows. So really, what we're working on really is, is a pragmatic delivery within the confines of what is a current uh, legislative position, and have decided to just crack on and do what we can, rather than stop and sit and wait what happens with the law. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Oh.
Uh, one question for Claire, then I'm going to open up. We've got some microphones to circulate around the room. So, um, where does the private sector fit into Surrey Hartman's partnerships and plans? Um, do you want me to talk about Virgin? <laughs> so, uh, until March the 31st, we've had Virgin as our uh, one of our community providers. Uh, and actually, we've gone through a series of re-procurements of the three CCG's community contracts. So, Virgin previously ran a community contract for the majority of Surrey, uh, and first, the North West Surrey CCG went through, and the contract was won by CSA Surrey, which are a uh, social enterprise, and are evolved now across the top end of our patch. The Guildford and Waverley contract is the one that ends on March 31st. Uh, and that's now been won by uh, an integrated bid from the Acute Trust plus the GP Federation. And in the Epsom area, this C the CSH Surrey contract came up, and actually instead of bidding on their own, they have bid collectively with the three GP Federations from Surrey Hartlands plus the Acute Trust, and themselves again as, uh, as an alliance to bid for the community contract. So we... We've always had a large number of um, AQPs in Surrey, um, traditionally set up by GPs. Uh, they continue to operate, they continue to uh, offer elective services, but in terms of our community services, we have fewer than we did. So you're bringing some of those services back in-house, having gone through a period when they've been contracted to version. Microphones are at the back of the room. This is your time. We have uh, 25 minutes or so before the end of our session. Rebecca, I see your hand. If there are colleagues on this side or indeed this side, please signal. Tell us who you are. Rebecca Rosen from the Lafayette Trust. It's a question for Graham, and I wonder if you know about or have thoughts about the Valencian integrated care system, the which um, was one of the clusters... We're not hearing you too well, Rebecca. Uh, That's better. Uh, if you know about or have comments about the Valencian Integrated Care System, Rivera de Salud, which is a public-private partnership, it was one out of about six that they awarded, I think, in 1999. I think it might be the last one standing, but the terms of it are that it, the contract is offered at a significantly lower rate than the public contract. Uh, and that they are, they have a capped profit, and like that's the feature that I, th I think is interesting. That they cannot earn more than about seven percent as profit, and then everything else goes back to the Valencian government. And I just wondered if you have thoughts about that. They they are held up as a kind of exemplar of effective integrated care that has endured. And although they're not hugely transparent about their outcomes, it does look like they've achieved reasonable outcomes. And I think you you've been to visit, haven't you, at some point? So I have been to visit twice, and one of the things that struck me was there was 18 months between the two, and the charming primary care physician that I went to see was sort of looked a bit run ragged the second time that I went to see him, which is true of my own GP existence here, but they are certainly getting efficiency out of them, and you know, so there are questions about sustainability, but I, I, you know, I, I think that the financial model is interesting, I wonder if you've got any thoughts on it. Um, I, I haven't, um, I think one of my fellow claimants may have, but this may be a very old-fashioned reaction, but I think why can't that 7% be in, go, stay in the public purse? So uh, just as a response to that, what they did up front was, it, what they did up front was make a huge investment in integrated data. And I think I went with Chris to one of the first visits to integrated health systems in 2003. They have at their heart exceptional integrated data. Right. Okay. And they've put a huge investment into that that has enabled them to do a lot of what they do now. Okay. Other contributions? Good. Um, it's a reflection to Claire, nearly. Yes. Um, it was really fantastic to hear you talk about, sorry, I'm Ruth Bennett, I'm uh, Director of Maternity and Early Years at the Public Health England. It was fantastic to hear uh, you talk about the importance of integration in, at the beginning of life, the first out of one day is the best start. I think for perfectly understandable reasons when we have this conversation, even if we talk prevention, which we could do more, we tend to start the clock with adults and chronic disease 
If we do not come into this conversation and understand we have to start right at the very beginning with some of those vital determinants and some of those services, we're going to lose the battle for generations. So it was great to hear, and I'd love to hear more about it. If you're okay with that, I'll follow up on that. Yeah, please do. That's great. Then on that point, um, I mean, Claire, I've seen from my experience with you the involvement with local authorities and the, um, the perspectives they've been able to bring to bear because you're very strong on the Marmot Health Inequality Agenda as you've been discussing and local government has contributed to that, I think. Yeah, we've got an excellent uh, Director of Public Health, um, Helen Atkinson, who's also the Director of Adult Social Care. And I think, again, her really strong leadership and also the fact that she was in Surrey PTT, so has that longevity of relationships uh, with any number of us within the system, I think has helped enormously. Um, but it's, it's not just about Surrey County Council. All of our acute trusts have all said, give us indicators that we will look at as a board so we can start to progress this the first thousand days agenda. So it, it's... And it's the first time I actually, a lot of this stuff you do because you know it's the right thing. Uh, actually seeing um, chief executives becoming exciting about the possibility of generational change and volunteering to, to do something because they know it's the right thing suddenly makes it all very exciting. So there are three hands on that side of the room. They take two and then I think you get Mike in the middle there. Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. It's great to hear something positive going on in health and social care. Um, I've got a sort of practical question. I'm Jane, I feel like I'm the Chief Executive of the Faculty of Social and Reproductive Healthcare. Our experience of, of being, or funding of contraception being moved into local authorities has not been a particularly positive one in terms of an integrated approach to, to women's health in particular, and even pre, pre-birth health. Um, and I suppose one of the things that we felt has been an issue has been uh, the professional uh, boundaries and identities have sometimes been problematic, plus some local authorities not really wanting to involve clinicians in tackling uh, health and social care issues. And I just wondered if, if you've experienced those difficulties, how you've overcome them. Okay, let me take the other two questions and we'll get responses to all three. Sarah? Sorry. 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 Um, Debbie Sorkin, the Leadership Sorry. Centre. It's a question for all the panel, really. Um, in Cambridgeshire, in the recent years, yeah. um, a very large-scale integrated contract involving the private sector did not end well. Partly it was said because the skills weren't necessarily there on the NHS side. Apologies yeah. to anyone from Cambridgeshire who knew you. Uh, but also because the advice they got from the NHS centrally didn't prove to be up to scratch. To what extent are those skills, do we think, now in place? And if they're not, how are we going to get them? Thank you. And uh, in the middle, Mike. Mike Hopley, self-employed policy and strategy consultant. I, I should declare an interest that, that earlier in my career, when I was at Macmillan, I was one of the instigators of the, the Staffordshire Cancer and End of Life programme, a rather ambitious um, scheme, some would say in hindsight, to a point to prime contractors that cover cancer and end-of-life pathways across across Staffordshire. One of uh, our reflections at the time was that you guys, the, the, the system, had were severely challenged in understanding patient and costing data and, the, and the, the, the allocation of costs by patients as they move between services between different providers. So my question is, have you cracked that, or, or, or are you taking the view that potentially, as with hypertension in Dudley, there were such obvious wins that you don't need a full costing understanding in order to achieve? Particularly interested in uh, response to Debbie's um, observation, because I think the procurement rules are being tightened to learning some of the lessons, and you've been part of that. Uh, yes, yes. So uh, in terms of uh, if I to pick yeah. up that kind of third question uh, first, um, I, there's a, there's an awful lot you can do to improve the way of working um, without um, additional costs. For, for example, um, the multidisciplinary team working that we've established in Dudley, uh, we've done by just simply redesigning the way people work. It's not cost additional resources. In fact, the only additional investment that we put in has been into the voluntary sector. 
Um, and uh, but what we, we what we did is we took a very simple design concept, which is that uh, we want to maximise the potential of our staff to work best together, so that they can do the right thing together. So to do that, we put them in teams working for the same population of patients in small teams around small smaller populations, and by by freeing them up to work collectively together, they then they are then empowered to achieve better results for their patients. So. By thinking about intelligent design, about and how do you really mobilise people? Because yeah. our NHS, in the end, is a is a people business. It's a, it's the population and it's our staff. By thinking intelligently about how do you enable people to work more effectively together, I think you can achieve a lot. Um, um, but also, you know, if you take the case of hypertension, it was just simple uh, no brainer. Really. You know, we have uh, mortality rates that are unacceptable. We need a concerted effort to deliver improvement and year after year we focused on that to drive that improvement across the system. What we want to be able to do is drive that same level of improvement across every single long term condition. Um, but in coming to the kind of um, the point about uh, skills procurement, uh, you know, undertaking this kind of procurement is a complex process. It's also a very long process. Um, uh, it is now, there are, uh, there's an awful lot of assurance around the process now, so we have something called the Integrated Support and Assurance Process, uh, which both NHS England and NHS Improvement are involved in. And uh, we, uh, as a CCG, we had to go through all sorts of assurance processes before we started the procurement, and we will have to go through all sorts of assurance processes before we complete the procurement. We have to thank Cambridge and Peter for that. I'm not sure how much I thank them for that, but, um, but, uh, uh, it is not a straightforward task, and, but I, I think the key thing really though is that I don't think you can enter into this kind of process until you have really strong partnerships in place and you, until you have a really clear sense with your population about what you're trying to achieve. And we spent many years starting with really trying to understand the needs of our population and how we could design care better. We spent many years as a partnership across health and social care with primary care and secondary care, working together on testing out different ways of working. And it's only because we've got that strength of partnership that we're in a position to really take it to the next step, which is to say, now let's, let's kind of formalise this and hardwire this into the way we work on a more permanent basis. Um, I think if there was a way of shortening the procurement, I think that would be a good thing. If there was a way of transitioning from the current structure of commissioning to a new arrangement without the need for, in effect, what is a three-year process. I think that would be extremely beneficial because it's, it's, it, if we could shorten that length of time significantly, that would be to everyone's benefit. We've heard, haven't we, alternative models. So you can use alliance contracts. Uh, Claire was talking about that. You can use the lead provider arrangements there in place in many parts of the country. There must have been times, Paul, when you thought, is it really worth going down this route? There still is, to be honest. But uh, the, uh, uh, but I, I, I look about this for the long term. So what we're trying to do is hard, is hardwire long, long term benefit into the system. Yeah. What we're trying to do is really support our frontline staff in a way by you know restructuring the system to properly support them and align to the way they're working. And also at the moment, my teams renegotiate the same contracts every single year. We waste a huge amount of time. Re going through the same process year on year, renegotiating the same contract every year. Far better to establish a longer term arrangement um, where we can then focus on actually what the real interest is, which is how do we, what, what's the development of outcomes that we want to see uh, year on year. And just finally, on, on your example, you talked about the options for the GPs and the attraction yeah. of using the ACO contract because it was a way of getting the GPs much more involved in and leading the work that you're doing in Dudley, at the moment, uh, your GPs, what sort of degree of involvement will they have? Partial, full, or something in between? Um, so, um, at the moment, our GPs are central to the team that is putting together the plans. Um, I think, to start off with, the vast majority of our practices will start partially integrated. That's, that seems to be their express preference. Um, but one of the things that I think is really powerful about um, the, the team that's working on this is when you talk to our lead GPs in Dudley, what they say is that there's, they want the MC, our multi-specialty community provider, they want to establish in such a way that it would almost be a no-brainer for practices to want to be fully integrated. Why would you not want to design the way of working that 
affords the maximum potential integration. So, um, and, and the key to this really is that this is a development process. This is something that takes time. And we need flexibility to facilitate you know, that OD journey with our providers, but particularly with our GPs, because you know, our GPs are central to the integration of care. The patient registers with the GP practice. The GP is the main portal through which people get access to care. We need to have integrated care that's designed around the way general practice works, but that properly supports general practice. And to be clear, partial integration within the ACO means the GPs keep the GMS, PMS contracts. They're not wrapped into the overall ACO contract. They, they, keep, the, they keep the GMS contract, but they, but they have a formal integration agreement about how they work in partnership with the MCP that, yeah. um, around how they collaborate together and what the mutual benefits are for, the, the, for them and their patients. Okay, so great. Yeah. Two responses. One is it doesn't have to be like this. You don't have to have procurement contracts to run health services. We do at the moment, but this is an entirely artificial set of hoops we've created for ourselves to make NHS managers jump through. We then say, oh, they're not very good at it. They need lots of skilled commercial advisors. I don't know how many millions we must be paying on that every year. This is a choice that Parliament has taken about how the NHS is to be run and it can change it. The other thing to keep in mind all the time is if you have contracts, you can get it wrong. If they're long-term contracts, you can't get out of it. Schumacher said mistakes are inevitable, so make sure they're small. Uh, why? There's a question down here, and then we'll come back to the other point. Did you want to pick up, sorry, we didn't do Jane's question. Oh, sorry, yeah, thank the, you. Um, about the, how you work with local authority colleagues. We in a room back in County Hall in Kingston and are actually signing off their Section 75 agreements for next year where we are pooling budget with the local authority so that decisions will be made, made at our joint commissioning committee. So because of that, that means you will have the democratically accountable uh, cabinet members making decisions about spend with the clinicians and with the lay members of the CCGs. So I think that's, that, for me, is, is our way of getting over that problem. And what's happening with the funding for sexual health services that were mentioned in the question? Are you having to cut back on that funding, not you personally? So, so, so there's a story there. So uh, prior to the arrangements that we currently had, uh, I think we've got some learning, which is why we would now do it differently. Yeah. So our sexual... And because of uh, HIV services being specialised commissioning and um, the rest being local authority commissioning, by joining it all up, I think we, would, we will now make better decisions than have been made in the past. But also, it's that impact on general practice. So by cutting the sexual health services, you just see the number of appointments in general practice just boom in terms of contraception, in, ter in terms of um, uh, the whole sexual health um, agenda. Uh, and so that's what we've got to make these decisions to get. The, the panel uh, say that this is going to affect a, a fairly small number of um, areas at the moment. Uh, proposals um, and perhaps look back at my, my familiarity in this from the public health world would be what we did in terms of integration and uh, working in a, uh, with an outcomes framework, working locally at area agreement partnerships. Um, what I'm wanting to identify is what's uniquely different about this particular uh, push for integration, joined up uh, services and um, better outcomes for patients. And if, if I could understand that, then I could understand what is the particular strengths or weaknesses of different models and, and, and understand better the, um, what all of the areas are trying to achieve through the integrated care system that's different or better or the same. What we learn from perhaps what we're moving towards. I mean, Simon Stevens on NHS England have said uh, this amounts to the biggest move to integrated care and population health of any healthcare system in the world. Perhaps the level of ambition is one of the things that makes it a bit different. Question over here. Thank you. Um, Colin Hutchinson, retired consultant from West Yorkshire, and also one of the claimants in the, one of the judicial reviews that's in place. 
it's wonderful to see the amount of enthusiasm that there is for the ways in which work has been taken forward in Surrey Heartlands and in Dublin. But we know from clinical trials that enthusiasts get better results. And with clinical trials, it's what happens when those results and methods are applied to the wider population. I would like to know what you feel about the results that were announced in Health Service General last week about the impact of Vanguard vanguards on uh, a number of measures that one might think has been uh, outcome measures, such as uh, the rate of emergency admissions and the bed day numbers, mm -hmm. which across the, band, the whole vanguard process have shown some moderation of the increase in the rate of emergency admissions, yep. but no impact on the bed days um, that, have, that, have, um, that are required. Um, so I'd like to know what you feel that tells us and whether that's sufficient uh, pause for thought before rolling out systems across the whole country. Okay. I would also like to comment, Rivera Salute has been raised uh, at the beginning of this discussion, but things have moved on there, as you probably are aware that the uh, when that model was tried to be rolled out to Castile, it provoked huge unrest amongst the medical and clinical uh, staff there, which meant that it couldn't be rolled out. It's now been taken back. The Valencian government have now taken back that system under, national, uh, under state control, and there's police investigation into Rivera Salute on grounds of corruption. Thank you, Colin. So we're rapidly running out of time. I'm going to come to each of our speakers and now panellists for their final responses to and reflections on the discussion so far. Paul, why don't you kick off? Well, um, Dudley was one of those vanguards. So um, I, I think there's a, I mean, whilst I um, understand the impact that we've had on collectively on um, tempering emergency admissions, I think it's a mistake, really, if we measure the success of integrated care in primary and community services by what happens in the hospital. We don't measure the success of hospital care by what they, how they affect general practice. So what is the, what's the measure of the success of integrated care? Um, and that really comes to the kind of wider benefits of the ICS. What's the, what's the, well, how do we measure the success of integrated care systems or integrated care organisations regardless? It should be about the outcomes for patients in the population. It should be about, our, can we achieve better same-day access for people when they need it with the right person if they need an urgent diagnosis? Can we achieve effective continuity of care where people co-produce that care, that, that their care plan, so that they, they're more involved in the self-management of their conditions? Can we deliver more effective care coordination so that people's social isolation and their whole uh, quality of life is improved? And can we affect population health and well-being so that healthy life expectancy increases? Those should be the measures by which we judge the success of integrated care systems or integrated care organisations. you agree with that, Claire? Yes, I do. Um, in terms of the... We're, in, we're, we're not a vanguard. Uh, so actually, <coughs> if you look at... So we are an enthusiast to come up, but despite the national, uh, the national sort of scheme, really. So uh, it does show that you can do things in isolation. And the reason why that has happened is because we've tried doing it on our own, didn't work. We've run out of money, run out of people to do it. Uh, and I'm seeing Nav sitting down there. So when Nav talks about primary care home model, he always talks about bringing back the joy of work, uh, which is hugely important. So we've got a, a general practice workforce in particular. We've got uh, one of the highest numbers of over 55s and over 65 GPs. We've got a high number of practice nurses over the age of 55. We've got a disaster waiting to get even worse. So if we don't do something differently, and if we don't do it collectively, <coughs> this whole thing will fall over for us. Yeah. And, and Graham, your JR and your work with other claimants has already had an impact. Um, yeah. There is going to be a consultation on the ACO contract and 
you can see that things are moving in a different direction. Are you optimistic that the concerns you've been expressing are now being heard and listened to? I, I think they're being heard a lot more. Having heard this morning of this fantastic work that's going on within current systems, knowing the intrinsic dangers of the contract that's proposed, which no one has said anything to say I'm wrong about this, unless and until the government can offer reassurances that these dangers are ephemeral, they shouldn't go ahead. It's as simple as that. And I think that's where public opinion would lie. And it sounds to me as though there's precious little enthusiasm for the ACO contract in the NHS either. But you would like to see the work that we've heard without the ACO contract yeah, of course. proceeding? It's, it's all terrific. I completely admire it. On that note of consensus, <laughs> thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry.